Welcome on behalf of Green Acre. You are now at Green Acre, virtually, of course. And we are very happy to have you. Um, as you may or may not know, you probably do, but uh, Green Acre is a, what's considered a Baha'i center of learning. I am very blessed to serve here at Green Acre as the program coordinator. My name is Jessica Gaines. It's a pleasure to see all of you. Oh my gosh, Juliet, I, there's so many people here that I haven't seen in a long time. So wonderful to see you all. Uh, and tonight we are very blessed. Sorry, I'm also letting people in the room while speaking to you all. Um, we are very lucky tonight, of course, to have a fantastic uh, panelist of artists who are going to be sharing with us ways of using art to build community. So let me just tell you a little tiny bit about Greenacre before we get started. Greenacre has been here in beautiful Elliott, Maine, on the banks of the Piscataqua River. Uh, we are right on the border with New Hampshire. In fact, if there weren't trees right next to me, I'd be looking at New Hampshire. It's, we're that close. Um, we have been here, uh, Greenacre has been here since the late 1800s, pulling people from literally at that point all over the world to come here and have conversations that matter, uh, to really focus on the issues of the day. Uh, and to also explore uh, different teachings, uh, including the Baha'i teachings and how we can apply those teachings to the issues of the day. Um, we have a big focus uh, these days on race, oneness, the oneness of humanity, which is really the guiding principle for Greenacre and the Baha'i faith, uh, as well as the arts and how we utilize the arts to address issues of the day, which is exactly what we're going to be doing here tonight. Well, it looks like you all are probably Zoom pros at this point. Uh, as you know, uh, we, we're, we are virtual right now because of the pandemic. And uh, this is a silver lining that we are able to have all of you here with us, which we would not be able to have were we not online. And we have learned that we need to continue this even when everything goes back to normal. Uh, we definitely need to continue this virtual space so that we can see all of your wonderful faces and hear your insights and uh, that you can spread what you're learning here to your communities. So with that said, you probably all know to keep yourselves muted uh, until you would like to speak. The subtitles are on. There is a way for you to turn those off if you would wish. You can take your cursor to the bottom of the screen. Uh, you'll see an icon that says live transcript with a little arrow in the corner. If you click on that arrow, there will be a place that says hide subtitles. Hi, Phyllis. <laughs> so many friends here tonight. Um, oh, my computer is being funky. What else do I need to tell you? Uh, oh, we love it when you all talk to each other through the chat. Uh, we want to hear what your thoughts are about what's being shared tonight. So if somebody says something and it really moves you, put that in the chat. Uh, if you're just like, yes, put that in the chat. If you have a question, put that in the chat. We love to have that sense of community. Um, and we're actually going to start with a bit of that right now. Um, if you all would put in the chat your reason for coming tonight. Why are you here? What are you hoping to get out of this? And what art forms may you potentially practice? We wanna kind of get a, a sense of, of what art different, you know, the diversity of art forms that we may have in the room with us tonight. So go ahead and put those in the chat. And <laughs> Helen Butler is awesome, Lisa, I totally agree. <laughs> and I'm here because I love Helen and Sharon. <laughs> That's a really good reason. Oh, yes, we have a lot. I know we have a lot of artists in the room tonight. I know we have writers, we have musicians, we have visual artists. We ha I bet we have a poet in here somewhere. We have, uh, what else do we have? Uh, beadwork, all right. Oh, nice. Actually, I, uh, that reminds me to do a plug. Our next art show, maybe I should save this till the end. I'll save this till the end because it's, it's a special, I, I don't want to, I will leave you hanging so that you stay and then I'll tell you about it at the end. Okay, oh, great. 
musician, collage maker, excellent, writer. Man, a lot of people love Helen. <laughs> All right. These are great. Thank you for sharing. So I just want to go over a little bit about the purpose of this evening and its connection to our current art show. Our current art show is entitled Just, uh, and when I say R, I mean Greenacre. Greenacre's current art show is entitled Just Diverse United, The Destiny of America. And some of you probably know that that is taken directly from a message that the Universal House of Justice wrote to the Baha'is of the United States, uh, I think it was July 22nd of last year, specifically addressing the issue of race and the oneness of humanity. And there's a quote here uh, that I would like to read to you. And it's from that letter. And it says, and this is the House of Justice speaking again to the Baha'is of, of America, the United States. We ardently pray that the American people will grasp the possibilities of this moment to create a consequential reform of the social order that will free it from the pernicious effects of racial prejudice and will hasten the attainment of a just, diverse, and united society that can increasingly manifest the oneness of the human family. So we know that art can be a vehicle for contributing to the creation of a just, diverse United society. And these discourse spaces that we're having, they're one way of exploring how to do just that. How do we use art to do what the, houses, the House of Justice is basically telling us needs to be done? How do we get creative with this work? And this particular, uh, dis we call these discourse spaces. This particular discourse space is focused on how art can build community. And a major part of building community is opening hearts. Now, the following quote that I'm going to read again, and this will be the last quote that I read, it's also taken from that same letter. And this quote is about the power of love to transform. Now, we're not saying that love and art are synonymous, but we have a hunch that art can be used in a similar way. So the quote, and it's not the, it's not the quote in its entirety. I've I've taken a few words out just to truncate it a bit, but it says, ultimately, the power to transform the world is affected by love. This love is disseminated by enkindled souls through intimate conversations that create new susceptibilities in human hearts, open minds to moral persuasion, and loosen the hold of biased norms. We have a feeling that art can do some of that, that art can open hearts that art can open minds and loosen the hold of biased norms. So tonight we'll be hearing and experiencing how our three wonderful artists, which I will introduce them to you in a second here, how they're building community by affecting hearts, by using the arts. Then after we hear from them, we're gonna split up into three breakout groups. Each one will have one of the artists in it. Uh, oh, I hope I know how to do that. I just realized I need to run that side of things and wrap up. We'll come back together and share any realizations, inspirations, or plans we may have come up with for how we want to use art in our communities to open hearts and to build community in your own way. So while listening and engaging with these artists in the next couple minutes here, I want you all to just be aware of what these artistic endeavors that you're seeing from these artists, what they're actually doing to your own heart. What is inspiring you that you see in them? What's inspiring you to take action? And maybe what is that action? And what are you aware of in the moment that may be holding you back from taking action in your own community, using art to build community, using art to open hearts? So we'll discuss these questions in the breakout session. So I just want you to be pondering that while you're listening to them. So I'm gonna introduce each artist. Um, but let me just say that we're so lucky to have with us Helen Butler, Sharon Davis, Sharon Nesbitt Davis, and Jacqueline Clare. Now I'm gonna introduce each artist right before they share. Um, so we're gonna, and we're gonna start now uh, with Sharon. So Sharon Nesbitt Davis is a writer, a mime, a storyteller, and a visual artist dabbler who facilitates something called creative recharge 
and rebel writer workshops for all ages. She is the author of the memoir, Intended, A Marriage in Black and White. Sharon lives with her husband, George, in Rockford, Illinois, my hometown. Their son and daughter are now grown and married with their own families. And let me tell you, their son and daughter are also phenomenal artists in their own right. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to Sharon. All right. Wow. So um, I really don't want to talk too much. <laughs> That goes back to my 30-some um, years as a mime. I'm far more comfortable doing rather than talking. And we really wanted this to be more experiential. And as I look at the chat, I just see, you know, you all are artists coming here or, or you know, have certainly been involved in the arts in many ways. So I know I'm talking to the choir here, and um, and that's that's a wonderful feeling. But I'm hoping that you all have something to write with, and I will give you a moment to get something to write with if you don't already. And while you're doing that, I will talk about just a little experience um, that I had with writing and and why I am now so passionate about it. Um, as, um, as Ari has been mentioned, I, I was really primarily a mime for 30 some years, um, but that always involved stories. I mean, with mime, you're doing the essence of something and you're not using, using words, but you're always finding the essence of story. And story is, is, is the essence of, of all art and human interactions and those intimate conversations. And what I always long for in situations is heart to heart. And the arts I know, and we all know that that works. Um, so when I started doing writing, there was a part of me that was feeling very selfish about that because I thought, okay, you know, I'm just gonna be in a room by myself and you know, does the world really need what I want? You know, what I want to say and, and all of those crazy things that go into your head. But um, one thing led to another and I found myself up at Door County in a place called The Clearing and going to a writer's workshop um, for women. And I didn't know anybody. They were all, you know, strangers to me. And walking into the room, I immediately felt that this was not where I belonged. And that night I called my husband, George, and I said, this is a beautiful place. It's, I mean, it's just gorgeous, but I don't think I'll ever come back. And by the end of the week, these people who I thought I had maybe nothing in common with, I loved them like sisters. I came, went back every year, <laughs> then, except for last year because of the pandemic, you know, 12, 11, 12 years now. And I felt like I knew them better than I knew people, even within my own Baha'i community that I had been with for 20 some years. And it's because we were sharing ourselves, we were being authentic, we were sharing our hearts, and there was, there's an empathy that I don't know how else you get it, frankly. And so I decided, wow, this is a way to build community. And so I was already doing some women um, spirit devotionals. I started adding writing to that. And we've been doing that now for 10 years and more people um, are coming coming to that and, and we're, we're using writing as, as a way um, to become authentic ourselves. And this is where I feel that sometimes, you know, we, we talk about, you know, we love the world and we love each other and we love humanity and that is what it is to be a Baha'i. Um, but we have to become authentic with that friendship and with that love. And some of that means a big part of it to me has meant I have to become authentic myself. I have to be truthful 
if I can't be truthful to myself, how am I really going to have a loving and honest relationship with someone else? And so the writing ends up being both a way to, um, for me to figure out myself, share my thoughts, my story, putting it out there and finding others that also resonate with that. And um, so what I want to do, because every single art form has um, the different skills that, that you can learn, you don't have to dedicate your life to it, but if you learn some, some basic skills, you can participate more deeply. And so, um, so I just wanna share one, one thing that you can do. You can do it on your own. You can do it with other people. But I found it is, it's a really good way to do almost an active meditation. So the first thing I want to do is just share with you um, rules for we're going to do what we call a free write. These are the rules for a free write if you've never done it before. Um, once you begin, you just keep your hand moving. <laughs> this is the idea of tr try not to, to uh, let that editor <laughs> that's in your head sometimes, that may be the fourth grade teacher, don't, don't let that person in there. So you just keep moving. You don't cross things out. You don't worry about spelling, punctuation, grammar. Don't overthink. Don't get logical. Release control. Be courageously truthful. Okay. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to choose a prompt and um, can be any of these. Right now, I hope. Right now, I want. Right now, I need. Right now, I wish. Any of these can work. And with free writing, sometimes you start to write and, and this prompt goes out the window and that's fine too, okay? All right, so I'm gonna stop the share for a moment. Any questions about what it is I'm gonna ask you to do because we're going to just take a deep breath and then we're gonna do a free write. I have a, a, a bell that I'll ring when you start and we're just gonna do it for a, a a little bit and then I'm going to actually stop you and I'm going to give you another sentence to write and then you're going to go on. Okay, are we good? All right, here we go. I got to get my timer going here so I don't, <laughs> I don't get carried away myself. Okay, all right. So just take a deep breath in and out and in and out. And begin. Now pause. And what I want you to write is what I really want to say is, and then continue. And continue now. All right, and just find a stopping place. Okay, and if, if I was actually doing this in a workshop, we would do the, <laughs> what I really wanna say a few more times. It would be about a 20 to 30 minute exercise all, all together. But I just wanted to give you a little sense of it. Um, and we had thought that perhaps uh, people might wanna share, not, I can't, we can't, sh everyone, but um, does anybody want to share what they wrote? Um, because, of course, a part of what really helps to bring the connection is the willingness to actually share with each other um, ourselves. So if anybody is willing to do that, um, 
can just unmute yourself and share. Hi, thank you, Sharon. This is so cool. Um, all right. It's kind of funny, but I hope for what Sharon said that people in our communities can be more authentic with our love and friendships, be more authentic with ourselves and each other, that we can have frank and open and honest conversations and consultation, that strong personalities can listen and be humble enough to also learn. That would be super awesome. And we get so much done in our work toward oneness and unity and diversity and social racial justice and harmony. Okay, sorry. Who keep fixing my spelling errors? <laughs> but otherwise, this is being true to what Sharon asked. It, what I really want to say is that I love this activity of free writing without editing for the most part, I'm not editing. Okay, I need to stop worrying about my spelling mistakes now so I can get to something more deep. Yay, this is great to connect and hear from other artists so I can learn more about engaging with my community and be inspired to share more of my and their creative methods for unifying and communities, our communities and in our work, in my work for kids. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So, okay, um, we might have time for just one more if anybody else wants to share. All right, here it goes. This is a stretch. <laughs> I pray, therefore I am. The angels answer. They say, patience, love, detachment, the insistent self cries out in protest, but is no match for the tablet of Ahmad. To whom may I offer thanks for this? I was heedless. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, um, I think my time is, is at its end for, for right now. Uh, thank you for doing, being here and, and um, doing the exercise and hopefully um, you can see how that can work for you. So, all right, back to Jessica. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Thank Thank you, Sharon. So again, this is an opportunity, you know, this is an example of, of how we use art to build community. So this, these are just inspirations for you all to get tastes of what is possible. Okay, next up we have got, we've got Helen Butler. Helen holds an MFA in theater arts from Brandeis University. Helen was nurtured in the cauldron of narrative art making and social justice. Inspired by performance artist, activist, Vinnie Burroughs, Helen began her career performing story through the lens of African-American poetry. While earning a living in New York City working for social entrepreneur and independent television producer, A.H. Perlmutter, I just love that last name, I don't know why. She spent her evenings performing classics from the Black Diaspora with Ernie McClintock's Repertory Company. These years of rich creative exposure later encouraged her to devise applied theater slash social justice interventions for national housing, regional social service, and local juvenile justice agencies. Child abuse and sexual assault prevention nonprofits, college and university departments and faith organizations. In more recent years, she's been exploring the complementary movements of self-reflection and community engagement through fiber arts and theater, respectively. Her fiber pieces invite a release from the emotional bonds of modern living, while the engagement theater practice seeks to strengthen community ties by exploring narrative through audience participation. She has authored two publications on art making on art making practice, Response and Mirror Bright. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Helen. Thank you, Jessica. So it's like part of this is if you live a long time, you get to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> Uh, I always also want to want to honor those who actually have come before me and actually were influences for me. And so when I mentioned Viney, 
And when I mention Ernie and Al, these are people who, whose, um, whose influences I have felt deeply. So just a little bit of background. Uh, what I'm gonna to share tonight is on um, uh, appreciative, uh, is, is on engagement theater. Um, and for those of you who were at the conference earlier today, forgive me, because it's gonna be the same video we had earlier today, but oh well, but I'll have a different little header here. So- She's talking about the Race Amity Conference in case anybody- Yes, yes. So um, for, for those of us who are Baha'is, we know that the, um, the House of Justice has been guiding us towards engagement and community building. And I've been um, particularly um, wrapped my heart around the idea that um, the, the quote from Shoghi Effendi that says, the day will come when the cause will spread like wildfire, when its spirit and teachings will be presented on the stage and in art and literature as a whole, art can better awaken such noble sentiments than cold rationalization, especially among the masses of the people. So my view is really on the masses, not necessarily on us as Baha'is, but really, I really ha have this very strong desire for communities, and I mean the large community, to uh, recognize the writings of Baha'u'llah. Um, and so in um, back in the uh, mid 2000s, I met a young collaborator. Um, her name is Andriana Lefton, and she needed a piece for the Welcome Center. And um, it was in honor of, um, we were getting ready to celebrate the Great Migration, uh, which is this massive move migration of African Americans from the South. Very, very few people are aware though, that one of the um, instigators of that movement was a Baha'i by the name of Robert Abbott. And so we, we talked about doing this piece and in celebration of the Great Migration, and then as we were talking, one of the things that we were exploring was the whole idea that if we're talking about community building, then doing a piece that actually has our audience just sit and listen to information, it, it didn't seem right or it didn't seem to be in alignment. And so we ended up um, discussing it, consulting, and came up with this, what were the seeds of what is now called engagement theater. And so it's a storyline, it uses appreciative principles. Um, and there's even a little itty bitty story around that. I had attended a conference and there was a facilitator who was talking about appreciative inquiry, which is a practice of um, having a community or an organization look at its positives and move in that direction. And so one of the comments that came from the facilitator was, well, if you just do the first leg of appreciative inquiry, um, you don't really get the movement that you, you know, things don't necessarily happen. What you get is people feeling good. And I go, well, wait a minute. I like that idea. I like the idea of people feeling good within the context of a performance because it gives you the opportunity to do that first reaching out towards relationship building. And so it's a theater process that actually builds or attempts to initiate relationships at the very at the very center of it. So what I have for you is a video. We know that theater is an incredibly immersive um, art form. And it always helps if there are many people who are involved. And so theater, this, this involves many people. Um, there's really no way unless we actually filmed a, um, an uh, engagement theater performance, but then I think that that would be a little bit too distracting. So what I'm gonna give you um, this evening is more the essence of what that piece, the beginning stages of that piece um, uh, looks like. And then what you'll also note is there are time periods within the piece where the audience 
is asked to engage with one another, not just the actors. We've actually even had audi audience members perform part of the story that we're offering on the spot. And so far, we haven't had anyone turn us down. We have had some pretty interesting performances though, but at any rate, here we go. So I'm going to share. The Journey, Robert Abbott and the Great Migration. You enter a semi-darkened room, which is set up like an early 20th century rail car. Chairs are in rows of three facing three to resemble the rail car berths. You're encouraged to sit with people that you don't necessarily know. The year is 1916. This is the fellowship car. The Alton Railroad likes to name its cars. But, as you can tell, this is a unique car. Contrary to the dictates of the time, which call for separate riding conditions, we'll be traveling according to the real reality, the reality of the oneness of humanity. We hope Mr. Abbott will be pleased. We'll be leaving shortly, but in the meantime, take a moment to say howdy to your riding companions, if you don't know them, and ask them what they brought along to eat on the train ride, cause it's a long one, and if they have enough to share. journey is in honor of Mr. Robert S. Abbott. During this journey, time is fluid, but most importantly, we're going to ride the rails of the heart and spirit of the man who sought to elevate a people. Mystics say that there are cities that the heart visits as it travels through life. These are the spiritual cities we'll visit. We'll stop the train and invite you to visit these places of spirit and heart with us, separate but equal, is the law of the land in 1916. The Civil War ended a little over a half a century before, but any strides made by Black Americans slipped away as quickly as they were made. At the turn of the century, the majority of the race lives in the southern states of Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Virginia.
Abbott is the only child of former slaves Thomas and Flora Abbott and was born in 1868 on St. Simon's Island. His father, Thomas, would die the following year. We've arrived at our first city, the city of self. What did this self-made man have to know about his own self and how did it show up? The mystics say that knowledge of God is the beginning of the knowledge of self. In some ways, it can show up as the initial place of assertiveness, perseverance, and faith. As Robert was approaching the age of choosing a course for his life, he was plagued by his social awkwardness and his skin color. Not only was he an African-American, he was a dark-skinned African-American. In a social system that aligned itself with, if you're white, you're right, if you're brown, stick around, and if you're black, step back. While attending Hampton Institute, his classmates played cruel jokes on him, and because of his social awkwardness, the young women would give him no consideration. He spent sleepless nights wondering how he would fit into a world where prejudice and discrimination dogged every step a black man took. One evening, as he sat on his bed alone in Stone Hall, downcast and discouraged, someone suddenly knocked lightly on his door. There stood the college chaplain, Dr. Hollis Frizzell. He was a white New Englander who had dedicated his life to education. Frizzell eventually taught Robert to value knowledge above words, mistrust mere formula, learn accommodation to realities and to observe rather than judge. More important, he taught him a method of functioning smoothly in a hostile world. From that point on, Robert was jovial and filled with zest during the rest of this time at Hampton. Now it's your turn. I did warn you that you would be joining us in these cities. So, when was a time that confirmed the real you? Maybe you didn't even know yourself and someone else saw your potential. Reach back into that past and share briefly with your travel companion. It's time to move out to the next city. The route takes us to the city of knowledge. The dangers of this city are trials and reversals, where we take two steps forward and one step back. Hold on. So the um, experience online obviously is not as, Im as immersive as if you're in a theater with travel companions, but I thought that that would give you some sense of what that experience was like. So I think that that concludes my section of the presentation. I mean, the, the breadth of what is possible uh, is immense. Um, as we can see. Uh, thank you so much for that, Helen. That is just the creativity that went into that is really staggering to me. Um, and it, it, it fills me with like a sense of what is possible, you know, um, thank you for that. All right, next on the docket, we have Jacqueline Claire. Um, let's pull up my bio real quick. Uh, Jacqueline Clare is a painter, illustrator, and storyteller with a background in acting. The focus of her integrated work is to empower audiences of all ages to develop a deeper connection to their spiritual reality. In addition to her spiritual realism fine art, Jacqueline recently published an illustrated Baha'i children's book, Noble Beings, and produces a bi-weekly podcast, Spiritual Conversation as well as an active YouTube, cha YouTube channel of Baha'i-inspired content for a wider audience. She lives in a little German river town in Texas between Austin and San Antonio. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jacqueline. Thank you, Jessica. I'm, I bet that I speak for everyone here. Like my cup is so full right now. And yeah, it's been so inspiring. And, you know, you, Jessica, you started this off with talking about how art can help open hearts. 
And from what we've all experienced this evening together, like I already feel so much more conscious of my own heartbeat, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, so yeah, it's, I'm honored to be here and just so like electrified by what we've been talking about tonight. I do have an experience that I would like to share with you guys again, in the spirit of, you know, sharing something that has existed, has been created that you might take some seeds from this and apply it to your own spaces. So uh, BC, before COVID, <laughs> I had a show, which is a very nice continuation. Helen's integrated the four valleys and I had a show that was based on the seven valleys. Awesome. And it was called Awaken to Your Life as a Spiritual Journey. And it was a blend of art show and spiritual storytelling and dynamic discussion. And I actually toured this show throughout the American Southwest. And so I've, I've engaged with all kinds of different audiences and demographics. And some of them were largely Baha'i, some of them no one was Baha'i and, and mixes in between. And the most powerful thing that I'd like to highlight tonight about those events was how much people shined. Mm. And within a two hour event, the level of insight that mm. arose and the courage and comfort to share that insight. Mm. And that's the part that I feel is the most encouraging for what we're trying to do here with community building. And uh, Lisa, with your free write, when you talk about consultation and having authentic and loving and frank you know, connections for growing our own community, growing in depth and in breadth, right? And bringing that gift to the world. If we can be able to come together and sometimes in very short times, not even knowing each other and so quickly be able to form a sense of trust and encouragement and creativity, and then also take that into deepening on the writings, the words of Baha'u'llah, and then sharing the insights that come and then building on that, you know, like as we're doing tonight, where everything kind of like the ahas keep building like this is this is such an incredible tool for how we can help truly change the world. And I think about Baha'u'llah's words where he says that artists and craftsmen advance the affairs of mankind. And it's like such a mystical and powerful statement. And I don't think any of us can can claim to fully dissect and understand what this means and what the implications are. But it's clear that art has this divine capacity to be much more than, you know, a pastime or entertainment or decoration or any of those sorts of things. If, if arts can actually like advance the affairs of mankind. So let me describe to you a little bit how the show worked and what were the features that I think engendered that, that community of trust. And then sort of similar to Helen, I'll give you just a little tiny simulation of maybe what it might be like to be there. Um, so it starts with everyone who comes to the space. And first off, it is it was advertised as a art event where the artist, who is me, is going to share her inspiration, which comes from the Baha'i faith. So we were always very clear that it was like the art already existed. They weren't invited to come paint per se. The paintings were already there. But, um, and the fact that I, I took the onus of sharing the spiritual element. You know, it's funny sometimes as Baha'is, like we can be very shy about who we invite and to what and that sort of thing. And it was like, you know what, I'll, I'll be responsible for it. You just invite them. This is, this is an individual sharing what inspires her. 
right? But it was, but I always mentioned the Baha'i faith, always mentioned that there was the spiritual element that was connected to the art in the show and that there was going to be an interactive discussion element. So everyone came knowing that. And again, as, as you all know, we're all the choir here, right? Art can be a magnet, it's very attractive and you can often attract a wider group of people than just, do you want to come to this religious thing, you know? And everyone who entered the space was personally greeted, right? We want everyone who comes to something remotely connected to the faith to feel valued, to feel a part of this space. And again, people would come who didn't know anyone. They saw the ad on Facebook and they came and they had a warm reception and they were invited to play an icebreaker, which involved them receiving <coughs> half of a quote. And it was, they were quotes from the Seven Valleys and their mission, should they choose to accept, was to mingle and find who in the crowd had the other half of the quote. And the purpose of this, it accomplished a lot of things. First, it even the social playing field. So it wasn't just like somebody comes in and they're like, oh, they're my friends. I'm going to go talk to my friends. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it really doesn't matter. You can say hi to your friends, but you have a reason to go up and talk to people you don't know. So it's like, oh, hi, I'm so-and-so. You know, this is what my quote says. What does yours say? And again, these were all quotes from the Seven Valley. So it's actually the words of God that people are immediately interacting with in this, this uh you know, sort of fun activity. And then they had to think about like, okay, well, if we pair ours together, does that thought make sense? You know, and of course the seven valleys is very elevated. And sometimes we did end up with like, you know, some rather like bizarre poetry where people thought they had a match and then they'd read it to the group and we'd be like, that's really beautiful. I'm not sure it makes sense. Um, but that was actually rare. Most of the time, even people who, you know, we know the language is super elevated, but most of the time people were able to find their match. Uh, I even did this event at Grand Canyon Conference with 60 young junior youth. I don't recommend it, but we did it and we survived <laughs> and they were able to do this as well. So like, for example, I have for when the true lover and devoted friend reacheth the presence of the beloved, the radiant beauty of the loved one and the fire of the mm. lover's heart will kindle a blaze and burn away all veils and wrappings. And so that's the valley of true poverty and absolute nothingness. So then people would find their match, right? And again, it may not be the person that you would have automatically gone up to make friends with, right? Different ages, different backgrounds, all kinds of wonderful shuffling of the people in the crowd. And then they're a team. And then they were invited to look at the art in the exhibit and consult and confer, but they didn't have to have the same opinion, choose which painting they personally felt went with the quote in whatever way. And there was no right or wrong. It wasn't like a quiz. It was an invitation for them to invite personal association as they looked at the art and then reflected on the words of the quote and, and to like kind of process it through their whole being. And then we would gather in a storytelling fashion and I would share some personal stories and where the artwork came from. And then we would actually take a storytelling jaunt through each of the valleys and share you know, the stories from those valleys, from Baha'u'llah. And then those different teams would be invited to share their quote and the painting they chose. And again, this is, this is what the event led up to because at, by that point, people, felt so encouraged and so comfortable. And there was this very interesting balance of reverence and play, you know? And just, just the insights that people shared were truly incredible. And, and again, I reiterate the fact that they felt comfortable sharing those 
in this space where maybe they had walked in not knowing anyone. And it, we're talking about the words of Baha'u'llah it was just such a great learning and confirmation. And a very interesting idea I wanna throw out that might sort of like unsettle some of you and also liberate some of you. And this is an anecdote that I shared during the storytelling portion before we got into each of the valleys. And it's based on some of the ideas of depth psychologist, Carl Jung. Hmm. And it's the idea that if the artist knows what he or she is about, if the artist knows the moral of the story, so to speak, then according to Carl Jung, it's actually not art, it's propaganda. Hmm. So it like has the intention of hmm. propagating a specific idea. And, and then he goes on to say that true art actually unfolds for the artist as it does for the viewer. So it may begin at the hmm. artist's own experience, but it actually extends beyond it. And I find that such a rich idea that it's not an artist's job just to like show you something, but rather to create an invitation that we can explore together. And that's really what we did in these shows. So what I would like to show you is um, two pieces of artwork and ideally, I would be able to set something up where there was more space for your own creativity, like give you more options and that sort of thing. But for now, I'm just kind of going to walk you through an as if scenario. And um, yeah, so that's what I'm going to do. All right. So, so this is an artistic rendering of so powerful is the light of unity that it can envelop the whole earth. And it's it's very on the nose, right? It's very, it's mm. almost a straightforward rendering of that quote from a, you know, humble, whatever artist perspective. Um, and I'm sure it, it resonates with many of you. And there's a, there's a warmth and humanity that comes from, from handmade art, I believe. But let's just play a little game of what if. And what if I told you that this painting represented the same idea Hmm. just hmm. what if and how might you see it differently and what conversations might it spark for example what if we were going below skin level what if we were going deeper what if this tree actually speaks hmm. to like the veins and capillaries that are underneath our skin, that exact same pulsing shared humanity that we all have no matter what time we lived, no matter where we were born, no matter what our experience, this is our life force. Closer than your life vein, God is to us. And isn't it an intriguing dimension of oneness that underneath our skin, we have these veins and capillaries and tendons and how much they look like trees and mm. how much trees look like mm. lightning and how much lightning looks like the veins mm. in a leaf or the wings of a butterfly. Or you might even think about the dream of Baha'u'llah with the fishes and the hair. Maybe this is water and this is hair. Well, let's go back to the tree and humanity and how this speaks to our oneness. And maybe these roots, right? The roots of humanity growing up from maybe the hard stones of oppression and injustice and struggle that is our shared humanity, the history of humanity, but it's rising up. And maybe those lines make you think of the tablet of existence. Mm. Or maybe it makes you think of sheet music and you have a sense of a melody. And maybe this area where the leaves are, maybe this is like 
portals to the celestial realm or the mingling of dimensions that comes through prayer and humanity rising towards this celestial luminous orb. And that's just an example. I actually probably should have left it there for just a second longer so you could meditate on that. But just um, how sometimes when the art is nonlinear, but we invite some contemplation on the writings, that it helps us to see not just more in the art, right? The art is just a door to go deeper into the, the spiritual dimension of our lives. But how how this could move the conversation of oneness into a totally new direction. And then we could see how to apply that understanding to our lives. And let's just stay here for one more moment. And I'm gonna read a section from the Valley of Unity. So we leave the Valley of Knowledge, which was the last station of limitation and come to the Valley of Unity and drinketh from the cup of oneness and gazeth upon the manifestations of singleness. In this station, he pierceth the veils of plurality and fleeth the realms of the flesh and ascendeth unto the heaven of unity. With the ear of God, he heareth. With the eye of God, he beholdeth the mysteries of divine creation. Whoa, you guys, this is really intense. I also now really want to buy that painting. I was like, man, that's like good marketing, but it's way more than that, obviously. <laughs> that's just a byproduct. I was like, man, I really want that painting now. Wow, you know, it's so fascinating to me that there's the gamut is so massive. I mean, I said this before after Helen's like, Sharon's activity immediately engaged us and 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 got us like involved and cracked open our hearts to some extent for sure and I wanted to keep doing that and then when Helen did hers I'm like uh I don't want to just hear about this I want to actually do this and then Jackie's talking about hers and the same thing like I want to do that and I was like man Green Acre should do all of these things and then I was like no all of these people should do all of these things and whatever else it is that they have to offer the world. We're decentralizing here, obviously, as much as we possibly can. Um, so friends, at this point, um, we are going to uh, break, uh, um, split up into breakout groups. Uh, I'm just checking the, we may run a bit over 8.30. Uh, and of course, if you need to leave, by all means do so. So we're gonna uh, go ahead into these breakout spaces and we're gonna be there for about 20 minutes and then we're gonna come back together. And again, what we're talking about in these spaces is what did what happened to your heart during these exercises? What, in, what inspired you? What ideas do, are you now maybe floating around in your psyche that you may think, hmm, I wonder if I could do that in that in my community or in you know whatever community. And also what is potentially holding you back? So again, what happened to your heart during these exercises? Um, what inspired you? What are you thinking about potentially doing? And what might be holding you back? And perhaps the group can help you uh, navigate around that obstacle perhaps. And then we'll come back and we'll have a short closing activity and then we will call it a night. All right, welcome everybody back to the main room. I hope your breakout session was excellent. Um, so we wanna close out now with just um, any, does anybody have it? Did anybody have any aha moments that they that they want to share, or anything in particular that they noticed that really stood out to them? That was just a, a realization maybe that they had. So any 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 aha moments? Yes, Ed. What struck me the most, more than anything, not only just the inspiration I got from all of the presentations and all that was given, but in our small group, how interconnected we really were. It was just wonderful. We talked about how we are uh, kindred souls here, 
but yet in this little group, even in this group right here, we're all interconnected. And it one of the things we're doing with, with, with this, this course is to talk about the oneness. That was just a beautiful example of, of how we are one. Anything else that stood out to anyone or any aha moments? Or any plans for what you might do in your community using the arts? Yes, Frank. The aha moment is you need, needed two more hours to get there. <laughs> and, and, and the real challenge of compartmentalizing art in your life. You know, it felt like, how do I make this fit? And how do I make time for it? How do I schedule this in? And rather than it being central and centrality to your soul and your community and the way you function. So I feel like we were just beginning to talk about the challenges of that. Um, so anyway, that, that, that was my aha moment. Like, oh, I'm not the only one struggling with this. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be creative from uh, 7 p.m. to 8 tonight. It's like, that, I mean, that's just not, sometimes you, and then you don't feel it. You know what I mean? So, cause you, you are trying to schedule something that should be a flow, you know? But, but I think, I think though that you have to just show up, you know? I mean, you know, you can't, I don't think you can wait for the flow. You know, it, you just have to uh, be there and work. And then what comes out of that? You know, if you just say, maybe I'm talking out loud for myself, okay? You know, it's uh, if you say, okay, I'm just going to give it one hour. Oh my God, where did the three hours go? I'm really interested if anybody has any ideas for how they're going to use art to open hearts and or build community in their community. I wanted, um, I wanted to bring this up in our group and I didn't get a chance to for, especially Norma who was um, talking about her art and, um, and you know, if, if you're making bowls and stuff still and struggling with sculpture, um, I, I heard Jacqueline say what, you know, the first piece she got before she met you was for something was for an event and um, there is something that I have used to go to when I lived on Cape Cod was called Soup Bowls for Hunger mm -hmm. and all the um, potters on the Cape would donate a bowl, a few bowls, a dozen bowls and you just go there, get a piece of bread and soup and you'd pay like 20 bucks for a bowl or more. Um, so it, it was just um, my collection of my bowls is my favorite and how different they are. And it was so, once you touched a bowl, like it was yours and I wanted to touch all of them. I wanted more soup. <laughs> so just an idea, I mean, yeah. And it made a difference. I really feel like creativity is like the ocean. It's never ending. It's endless. It really are. The possibilities are, are endless. Well, friends, it is 836. And I, I want to honor all of your, your time for being here. And I want to thank all of our artists. Thank you so much for sharing your craft with us, for leading us these wonderful activities for for giving us a glimpse of, of what is possible and I didn't say this earlier because I felt like I had to be impartial but I, 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 I have to say it all of this well not all of this I shouldn't take credit for it uh, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Sharon Davis Sharon is my spiritual mom she taught me the faith can't talk about it anymore because I'm gonna cry <clears throat> so I just have to thank her of course <laughs> for everything, literally everything. So, all right, friends, thank you so much. We hope to see you again. Uh, our ne oh, I, I forgot. Our next art show is called Chaga Nolo San, which is the Abenaki translation of Walking in Beauty. It is an indigenous centered art show. 
It is specifically for indigenous artists and for the message that only indigenous people can give to the world, whatever that means to them. Um, there is one way, however, somebody mentioned that they, that they were a beater. There is one way that non-indigenous artists or people can contribute to this show directly. And it is through beading flowers uh, that are gonna be sewn onto an ABBA in honor of Abdul Baha. These are all being collected. They're gonna be sewn on. It's gonna be in the show. The show opens, ah, what is the show open, Ed and Frank? July 16th. Thank you, July 16th. Um, submissions are due June 6th, so please spread the word. You can, uh, I should have had this pulled up and put it in the chat, but you can find the, the artist's artist call at our website, greenacre.org, click on arts. You will also see an article there about how you can contribute a beaded flower if you so wish to but support the show. Chat too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Like Good job. Good, good looking out. All right, friends, I hope you have a wonderful evening. We hope to see you again at our next discourse space. We will, we always have them connected to our art shows. We appreciate you so much. Thank you all. Have a beautiful evening and a blessed life. <laughs>